Hume is the home base of Manchester's Halle Choir, and sadly the site of one of the most colossal examples in Britain of planning gone wrong. For the second time in just 30 years, hundreds of unfit homes are being demolished and replaced. Will history repeat itself, or will it be third time lucky for the people of Hume? Manchester City Council and the developers AMEC, together with a chunk of government city challenge money, are the latest consortium to try to turn Hume's fortunes around. Already in the pipeline, more than 2,000 privately built homes, some for sale, some for rent. There's also new offices, new businesses, and one revolutionary space that has homes and businesses together. Of course, to do all this, you've got to move the people out again. Some people have seen it all before. I'm Sylvia Gordon and I've lived in Hume for 34 years. I moved in with my young family then and it was a masonette that we moved into and opposite, opposite, on the other side of City Road when we moved in there were rows and rows of little houses. I'm Margaret Carey. Uh, I was born in Hume. I've lived in Hume over 60 years. I was in the house in Pownall Street in the 60s when uh, they started to demolish the, re the rest of Hume. It, uh, it was traumatic, believe me. It seemed so quick, it was unbelievable, that we saw all these little houses and streets demolished. Well, my name is Alan Broom. I've been a tenant of Hume on and off from the early 50s until present day. I've lived roughly in the St George's area most of the time. But with the redevelopment that's going on now and previously, I've, been, I've lost my home three times as a result of the redevelopment. I moved to a brand new corporation house, three bedrooms, hot water, bath. It was wonderful. And then I watched the rest of Hume slowly being destroyed. The next thing we saw was this huge track and the crane lifting these lumps of concrete and building them into what became the Crescents. And at first, people were quite happy in the Crescents. I really can't pinpoint at what, at what stage people st started to be discontented and started moving out. The families have gone. The community spirit's gone. And uh, just the heart's gone out of Hume, actually, in a lot of cases. The old Hume. And, uh, well, we'll just have to wait and see how that how it progresses. How's that? Forward planning cheats the present day. History recoils, repeats another utopian dream, screams, eats itself away as the bullish bulldozers break the legs of these derelict, docile sculptures. The echoes of crackling concrete kiss the ground, spewing streams of bent steel, a flock of dying grey swans. You were supposed to be another New Jerusalem. Instead, it became a civic embarrassment, a national byword for architectural ugliness. And yet, they did have a plan back in the 60s. There was a dream to give the people of Hume back the life and community of their place by giving them back their streets putting them inside these concrete blocks rising into the sky. High rise, deck access. Wrong. It's remarkable that an artistic, cultural mistake could have created the country's worst urban ghetto. How do you stop it being either a yuppie haven or another ghetto? What's the way? I think you're actually perpetuating the myth there. Well, maybe it's not a myth, maybe it's a reality that the way cities That's are why being... I'm perpetuating it, because it's there, it's there, and we've, no one's escaped from it. You saying we're going to escape yes, from it? Yes, I am saying we're going to escape from it. I think what's happened in cities right across Europe, 
um, and maybe right across the world for the last 50 years, is that the people with money have withdrawn from the city centres. The minute they've actually had a chance to, they've actually moved out, leaving behind people who haven't got a lot of money, as a result of which the shops get poorer, um, the schools decline in standards, and people just, the minute they get on their feet economically, they want to move out. Now, what I'm saying is that, and this is really serious, unless we can actually reverse this, this situation, unless we can reverse the decline and stop cities fragmenting according to class, income, race, and all the rest of it, um, we're really on the road to nowhere. I first came to Hume because I started university on the very border of Hume and looked out the back of the department building and thought, what's that lot over there? 18 years old at the time. And um, so I went for a wander one day. And uh, it reduced me to tears, actually, the first time I walked into Hume. I couldn't believe that people were actually supposed to live like this. Um, which is the same reaction that everyone else that comes into Hume does. But then after that, I sort of met a few of the people and thought, um, ah, so this is where all the ideas live. It's all right you living here, and I know you liked it living here, didn't you? But originally, families lived here. We have to say that Hume was a gl gross mistake in that sense. Yes, Hume was a mistake because what they did was they took the old place that was functioning in some places, not in others, and said the whole lot isn't functioning, levelled it, and then said, oh, and by the way, you're living in this. Absolute horrific mistake. Homes for Change is, is a housing co-op. In other words, it's a collection of people that in the end will own their housing and also own their workspace collectively and run it. And no one else will. And will give us an opportunity to prove that we, were, we knew what we were talking Your about. Former residents. Former residents. Yeah. Homes for Change is a bit of an arc for the old Hume. The, well, not for the new old Hume, I suppose the intermediate Hume. This is to keep you going while the flood happens. Um, yes, and I think it's going to happen. I've seen the scheme they've got to go on this site, and it's a joke. And I've seen some of the other schemes to go on down the district centre, and they're fairly pitiful too. Uh, I don't hold out great hope that a lot of the stuff that will come out of this will be that good for the city as a whole, and I'm fairly confident they'll probably knock down some of it. But I think the other thing that Homes for Change is about is trying to prove that in order that if you're t doing social housing, you don't just need to live in a little noddy box at the end of a cul-de-sac um, and rely on public transport to get you to a shopping centre bloody miles away. We're talking about a proper lump of the city, like the cities that the, the British sorry, people are go you on holiday fighting to. for flats? Yes, absolutely. You're fighting for flats? I'm fighting no, it's for flat. cities. Well, here I am then. I'm sitting with an architect and a housing chairman and it was architects and housing chairman who got it totally wrong last time. Can anyone give me a reason why we're going to have more faith in the architects and housing chairman this time? <laughs> Perhaps because we've learned some of the lessons um, and taken stock of what went wrong last time. Um, I mean, there was a time when architects and housing people, politicians, could actually uh, sit down and plan developments that made sense and create neighbourhoods that worked. I think the lesson of the 60s and the 70s is that we forgot how to do that. I mean, most, most people I know in here who've done, gone through a participation process are incredibly proud. And even, even when a thing's not built, it's still a model or it's a bit of paper. They're actually very possessive about it because they're actually saying, that's mine. Change, change scheme is going to be like one of the things that people identify the new Hume with. They'll be saying, you know, people see a picture of it, instead of it being the crescents and all that sort of uh, dingy looking grey concrete, it's going to be this sort of radical architecture with the green roofs and the fact that there's sort of, you know, two dozen lively businesses in the bottom as well as just people living there. We are trying with this project to overturn the inherited cultural baggage of what are we talking about? Two or three generations or more of planners, of engineers, of developers who have grown up with zoning policies, who have grown up with the supremacy of the motor vehicle, who have grown up with the idea that suburban type treatments are really the only solution that can work. If there's, if there's one thing this building's going to be, it's going to be, be a beacon and a guide for the, for the rest of what goes on in Hume after it. I hope so. I suppose my only worry is that we'll be built by the time they've made the plans for the rest of it. In a way, it's almost as if we could have done with being the first scheme on the ground, because it would have given us something to sort of fight the uh, various suburban believers that, that want to make Hume a suburb, despite the fact that it's a ten minutes' walk from the city centre.
you must be pulled different ways because there are so many different opinions. It's not that easy for the simple reason that for, for the past 20 or 30 years, designers and city managers, housing associations, house builders have all built in a certain way. And that, that way was dominated by the concerns about the private car. In trying to turn that around and trying to say we, we actually want urban life, we want congestion, we want confusion at junctions, we want people to row at each other on street corners. Yes. When you try and convince engineers and you try and convince developers that that's what you want to build, yeah. you know, it's a hard one. But it, I, think, <laughs> I've con I think I've convinced <laughs> Dave, yeah. I'm reminded of the friend who said she didn't know she lived in a ghetto until she heard it in the news. Or the old Jamaican woman, one floor down and one floor up from the ground, who would cook dinner for my friend Glenn on William Kent. But for the past few years, this has become the anarchist playground, a, a grey blank slate for them to draw the fate of their world upon, a 24-7 a, a student heaven, along with the cockroaches theory-ridden. A place where even dogs are in heaven under the crescent's moon. One of the most exciting things I think about Hume is that throughout the 70s and 80s, it was a place that was really important as far as cultural industries yeah, are concerned. And that's something... The worse it got, the better it got in a strange way. Hume parties were wonderful things, yes. I mean, when the, fa when the families moved out, do you value those students and musos and dropouts? Well, put it this way, when we had, had our big community planning weekend um, and we were talking about, um, about culture and leisure and, and so on, somebody said something that's really stayed in my mind and I felt like writing it on the wall. They said the, the good thing about Hume was it was a kind of place you could take risks, artistically. This former Catholic church in Hume is a concrete and breeze block example of the dreams and plans for regeneration. Right now it's being turned into, they've nearly finished in fact, a series of workshops and small business spaces. When complete, this space then has to act as a catalyst for jobs, for work and for hope. Great job rebuilding it, but isn't there now the next leap, which is to get the people of you to do jobs, to have work and businesses that come in here? Of course it is. I mean, we, we have a lot of interest in, in lettings in the building, even before we've opened the building. We've already got tenants in. We're looking already? To get, already, before we open the building. What kind of businesses? We've got uh, a company that specialises in training in music technology. We've got a charity that's taking space. We're looking at uh, negotiating with booksellers, with printers, with people who make clothing. There's a whole range of people. It's a symbol, really, of the fact that, that somebody, whether it be the government, whether it be the community themselves, whether it be the private sector, whether it be organisations like ours, are prepared to invest in him. We've got the affluent city centre to one side, we've got Trafford Park, which is a, a, a large area of employment to the other side. We've got the affluent southern suburbs, and yet this area has, you know, amongst some sections of the community, up to 80% unemployment. Now, that, how, you know, how can that be? If you look at the, the, the numbers of people actually unemployed between 16 and, I think it was 21, it's in the hundreds. It's in the low hundreds. So we're not actually talking about tackling a problem that is impossible. This problem is solvable if the commitment, the will, the investment and the confidence of the people who, who, who are invo involved can be kept high, then we can solve the problem. Uh, it's one thing just to start rebuilding bricks and mortar, but there are so many other social problems that need to be dealt with if the area is going to be re regenerated. Employment has to be addressed in the area. And the the massive unemployment that, it, that is here currently uh, will continue to allow hopelessness to develop and to create a cocktail in which young people will get involved in drug dealing. Last week there was a, a fine by the police of um, an Uzi and one or two other weapons in some of the new housing. So obviously there are problems there still that had to be dealt with. Um, we would suggest that we have to undermine the dealing that goes on in the streets by looking towards setting up a, a methadone dispensing program which is, gives easy access to current opiate users 
uh, to a, a substitute drug, which will take them off heroin. Hi. Hi. Uh, what initial is it? Uh, GM. GM. One of the ways that we address the problem, the drug situation in the area, is through DASH, which is a local um, street-based initiative um, okay. looking okay. to give support yes. and advice to people with drug problems in the area. Um, what would you like? Um, one mil. It provides a scenario where people can bring their needles after they've used them for um, disposal in a safe way. It also is a, a resource in terms of putting people into the right um, treatment for them. And then also in terms of development work to look at uh, how we can address the situation with other agencies uh, in the city to make sure that the drug market is undermined. I'm a Chief Inspector of the Community Affairs Department in Manchester and basic my background has been one of drugs investigations and drug squad work. But the role I, I'm in now is one of working more closely with the community and looking at the drug prevention role, if you will. All the bodies have started to regenerate you and that is desperately required. But what we've still got is this underlying problem of drug addiction. And unless we get things like methadone treatment within the area, we're not curing the root cause. This is what Father Sumner at the forum is saying. This is what people in Dash are saying. This is what the city council is starting to say. So you might think it's depressing looking at rundown areas and thinking, my God, this is, this is as bad as ever I've seen in Chicago or New York or wherever. Yeah, OK, we've got that. But we believe we can beat it, and we can believe we can beat it in the short term with just a little bit of an injection of help. You've been lived into death, flesh picked from your bones, burned out cars shoved down your throats. You're there for the sick to gloat. This dinosaur rots in front of our eyes. Reminding us how it was starved into extinction, how for years it was deprived, choked, became sick and was condemned by its carnivorous predecessors. Now it is the anarchists and architects experimental laboratory for all and sundry to get in and try out. That's what Hume's about. Forward planning cheats the present day. History recoils, repeats another utopian dream, screams, eats itself away. biggest question, what happens in 30 years' time when somebody walks past and they say, what were these idiots doing building uh, this? But there are two reasons why I, I trust that th those people in 30 years' time won't be saying that. One is real diversity. We've not built everything like the Hume Crescent just because there was an industrial system that churned out those decks. We've not gone for that. We've got brick-built housing, and they're different. There's owner occupations, different housing associations, different management, different designs, different style. But secondly, we are reinventing the wheel. Uh, we have gone back to the kind of urban housing that has worked in not just this country, but in other countries for the last 150 years. You need ownership of a whole series of different levels. Yes, some, some people who come into Hume will own their own houses, literally own them, they'll buy them. But beyond that, uh, those same people and the tenants need to feel that they own the whole community, the park that we're going to build, the, the roads, the, all the, the facilities that make communities work. And participation, talking to people, communicating, consultation, it's a very general word, all those words, giving people the right to feel that their views matter, that they will be able to influence things, are important. Well, I just happened to be living here at the time, and I saw that there was quite a lot of people around who knew exactly what was wrong with their flats and knew exactly how they would like flats ideally to be designed in the future. They, they were around when all the mistakes were made in the 60s, and the only problem was they couldn't get a voice. They, they didn't have any opportunity to put their views forward. Now, that's what I think that our project has enabled people to do. It's a project that's set up by local people, and we don't design the houses, the people who are going to live in those houses design them. So the housing side of the redevelopment has been marvellous.
people have got what they wanted, they're going to be living in those houses and feel ownership. Now, if only they could have had the same level of influence over everything else that makes up the community, and that's education, it's schools and colleges, it's shops, it's the way the roads are shaped, it's, the, it's where the play areas are. Now, people have not been listened to. They haven't been allowed to put their views forward. And in fact, in some cases, decisions have come from above which everybody here, to a person, feels are wrong. Such and such a shopping centre shouldn't have been closed down. I mean, the Moss Side Centre wasn't great, but at least it provided some essential shopping. The Burley Adult Education Centre shouldn't have been demolished, not until there was a replacement. The Leaf Street Play Area shouldn't have been demolished, and it, and it will be soon. And, and it's because of dubious statistics and dubious decisions. I think the whole reason is that people aren't being allowed to have that much control over the new Hume, only in housing, and that's not enough to make up a community. We're moving on, keep it strong, don't you let them stay wrong, it's a group thing. People are celebrating, celebrating another phase in what the people, the planners and the politicians are praying will be the rebirth of you. Everybody's praying that they'll get it right this time, that history won't repeat itself and that this will be third time lucky for you. Who do you think the new Hume is going to belong to? A mixture of old and new residents. I think that there will be uh, some of the people who've lived here for years will be given access to some of the new housing, new jobs, etc. that will be generated in the area. But it's very clear to most people that all of the people who currently or in the past have lived in Hume area will not be the future residents. There will be some of the old, but a good number of the new people will be brought into the area. You happy about that? Hmm. <laughs> all depends. It all depends. All depends. Are you going to need credentials like a passport to get back in here, though? There is no exclusion of any group of... Uh, people. We want the very richest people to live in Hume, and certainly we, we're providing uh, social housing for those people in the greatest need. That's what we're here for. Nobody's excluded on that basis. There's a great wait and see thing that, that, that we're both sitting in the, in the middle of the place here. It is wait and see, isn't it? Well, the, you can't help but have a wait and see after the nature of the problem that was created before with the intention of solving problems. Therefore, people are wiser now. They're hopeful, more hopeful than ever. But because of the wisdom of hindsight, people are also going to be cautious in a way that they may not have been before. Probably hope with pure enthusiasm now been placed, replaced with hope with a little bit of caution. Wait and see. The beauty of democracy is, uh, on the one hand, it can make colossal mistakes, but on the other hand, it's got the ability to stand back and say, we blew it, and start again. And I think that's what, what Hume's about, really.